Dr. Kwabina Donko, welcome to Ghana Web TV. Thank you. Honorable, how was your upbringing like, your childhood and your background? How was it like for you? Well, I'm the eldest of the surviving children of the late Nana Nikun Abe Donko, uh, better known as J.K. Donko, a farmer, transport owner, a businessman. And um, I had a very normal upbringing in Yeji, where I started from primary one. Um, I lived with my grandma until she passed away. And in those days, before the Akusumbo Dam, there was the real Volta River. And there was this pontoon across the river um, that was pulled from either side by a chain. And you had Fulani herdsmen swimming on the back of their cattle across the Volta River as it was then. And a part of Fiji was called Salt Town. And I remember we had electricity then with these huge street lights. Um, life was simple. My grandmother was a trader. She sold food. She sold foodstuffs as well. And I started class one in LA number two primary school. Um, so very, very ordinary, like the average uh, rural dweller. Yeji was this small commercial town then. And there was nothing spectacular about my upbringing. What were your early challenges? At what point did you decide to come to the city? Did you ever, was, was there any challenge growing up? when you were in the rural area? No, my involvement in national politics, and that was really what brought me uh, to Accra, was as a result of my youthful exuberance in the late 70s and early 80s when the uh, first the AFRC and then later the PNDC um, came into power. Right from the Student and Youth Task Force, task force days all the way to the Projects and Programs Department of the then INCC, Interim uh, National Coordinating Committee of PDCs and WDCs. Incidentally, here in Job 600, then called the State House. Yeah, um, uh, with Inyeya Yen, Atampugri, Chris Atim, that whole group, yes. And um, that was really what brought me to the city. Um, at that time, some of us genuinely believe we could change the world. Um, I still have that fire, I still have that passion, the passion for the development of Ghana. And it's always, for me, it's always been about the development of this country. One of the things I've come to realize in life that no matter what you achieve as an individual, whether in academia, whether in the scientific field, whether in business, if your country does not develop, you are not respected. And so for me, the development of Ghana uh, it's still my number one dream, it's still my passion. And I believe I was, God created me the way he's created me to be an advocate for the development of Ghana, starting from the district or the constituency all the way up. And that is my life story. It's about development. It's about improving the quality of lives of the people. So for me, my priority is nation party self okay. in that order. And therefore, the development of the nation is so key to my being. Honor, what was the turning point for you, being a lawmaker? What inspired you? Who was behind your inspiration? How did you get here? In fact, indeed, I never wanted to be an MP. That was not, oh, that really? wasn't, you know. 
Um, I've been in government longer than I've been in parliament. Mm -hmm. I'm in my third term mm -hmm. uh, as a parliamentarian. Indeed, it was when, remember, when Professor Mills became the president, mm -hmm. he made me a deputy minister for energy. It was from there that I left the ministry to go and establish the Petroleum Commission as the first chief executive of Petroleum Commission. Earlier, I also became the first chief executive of BOST when we set up BOST. And so I've been in government earlier. Um, I was a member of the Confiscated Access Committee. I was at the PNDC Secretariat. Um, I was at the Casa Information Bureau. Yes. So. Becoming a member of parliament wasn't one of my ambitions. Mine was uh, to serve at the national level. It was the late Professor Mills, and may he so rest in peace, uh, who told me, Kwabna, why don't you become an MP? And that if he had lived and won the 2012 election, he was going to establish a ministry for petroleum. Oh. Remember, I was then chief executive of Petroleum Commission. So he encouraged me to come to Parliament. Do you have any regrets? And would you say it was a good decision you make coming to Parliament, or you, you would have preferred serving the state as a minister, deputy minister, or a CEO, rather than coming to Parliament? You see, I believe life serves you with a number of dishes. And it is not an a la carte where you choose what you want to what life and destiny serves you. Take it, make the best out of it. Distinguish yourself in that. Um, becoming a member of parliament is open uh, my worldview in areas that I would never have seen if I were just a minister or a chief executive. Yes, in terms of responsibility, uh, you'll be far more comfortable as a minister, as a chief executive, you are not a member of parliament, because then you don't have a constituency to nurse. Yeah. But in terms of impacting, especially your locality, becoming a member of parliament is a privilege, an opportunity that should not be missed, particularly if you are development focused. So uh, do you face any major challenge within this journey, coming to parliament, being a minister, were there any challenges you faced and you almost gave up? And, uh... No, as for challenges, yes. Um, you see, you never make omelets without breaking eggs. Mm -hmm. And for me, God has dealt with me differently. <laughs> anytime I've faced a major hurdle, anytime, like I lost my primaries, I'm taking it coolly because I know how God has dealt with me. Anytime one door closes, a bigger door opens. I will never have gone to school to um, University of Bristol, Lancaster, PhD, MBA, MSA, what, if I had not been detained in the so-called Kwashiga coup in 1989, late November 1989. Um, I was then a member of the Confiscated Access Committee. I was with the Castle Information Bureau, mm -hmm. young, active, cadre. And yet I was picked up. For doing uh, nothing. For doing nothing. Of course, I've always been vociferous. I, will, I've, I mean, I've never minced my words when I, I believe something must be said. And therefore, I was picked up uh, ostensibly for being part of a coup attempt. Of course, investigations proved otherwise, and I was cleared. Okay. And that was the launching part for me to go back to school. Okay. So anytime something has happened to me, you see, there is a silver lining in every cloud. You just have to look for it. Yes, yeah, so the challenges have been there when I had to resign as Minister for Power. Yes, um, yes it was sad because literally we had finished 
resolving the issues of load shedding, and every Ghanaian knows that, and yet I had to go. Um, and when I left, what that has brought to me is greater credibility among the Ghanaian populace. So yes, you know, life is not going to be a smooth ride. There will be bombs. But even then, look out for the best in the bombs. Honorable, I, because you mentioned it, um, I know this primaries was a, big, a major challenge for you because of how the outcome. Did it come to you as a surprise? Absolutely. It came to me as a surprise. It, but again, on reflection, it is a real challenge that we have in our electoral politics, especially in the deprived districts and constituencies. Do you place emphasis on the development of the area? Or you place emphasis on pleasing your branch executives? Mm. Not the population, just the branch executives. Because in my case, in Pru East, about 926, 27 people formed our conclave, mm. our electoral college to elect okay. the PC. Do you satisfy this group or you satisfy the broader population in Peru is? I choose to satisfy the broader population. I don't regret it. I paid the price for it. So be it. Because, for example, one of the arguments was that, yes, you've built schools, yes. you've built chips compounds, yes. you've connected communities to uh, the national grid, you've done boreholes, you've provided water. But all those things were provided for both NDC and MP people supporters. So, they want so what have you done for me as a as a branch executive or as oh. a delegate? And this cost you the election? Oh, it, it was all about that, other than some external hands, that, but it's okay. But the core of it was, and a number of MPs have that problem. People come, yes, you've done... The, help develop the area. Yes, you've done this. You've built schools. You've lobbied for rules. You've done so well in the case of infrastructure. Uh, even in skills training, we've done all that. But for me as a delegate, branch executive, what have you done for us separately? That was the personal individual benefit. Precisely. And for some of us, as I said earlier, my priority is the nation, the party, and self. If the nation develops, we all benefit. If the constituency develops, if we provide health facilities, especially for those of us from deprived um, districts, if you provide health facilities, you provide electricity, you provide schools, you provide portable water. Look, you have no idea when a woman particularly has to walk four miles to the nearest water source, after coming from the farm to go and fetch water to come and cook before going to bed. By the time she goes to bed, she's totally exhausted. Yeah. And as I used to tell the farmers, because the woman is totally exhausted, nothing can happen. Mm. So, the, <laughs> so, the, <Indeed. laughs> so the husband wakes up the next morning also in a bad mood. mood. So it's, this is society. Mm. And so for me, the development of the area, the physical, the economic, the spatial development, the provision of facilities is core to the work of the MP from a rural area. If you are from an urban area, no. the challenges are different. different. And so there is always a clash between the individual are you going to pamper delegates so that they will continuously vote for you? Or are you going to develop the broader environment so that come general election, you go to every community, they have something they can look up to. Dr. So that is the can challenge. Dr. write this wrong because if everybody believes they have to gain personal benefits before they could vote for somebody, it's, it's a big challenge because it means that they put aside the general development of the constituency to self-benefit. 
is this something we should look out for and how can we make this we, right? sh we should be looking a lot more at education educating the people educating the people letting the and when i talk of education i'm not talking about classroom mm. type of education conscientizing the people whose duty is that supposed to be um, the Center for Civic Education, the National Center for Civic Education, in fact, all of us collectively, okay. we must refocus what politics means. Mm -hmm. You see, if you look at the history of development in the last 50 years, those countries that have made major progress are those countries that are focused not on personal gratification, but on the development of the nation. They have strong internal consistencies. For example, um, I just got my research officer assistant to pull certain data for me. If you look at Ghana, South Korea, Ghana, South Korea, uh, Singapore, Malaysia, in 1962, Ghana was ahead of all of them. GDP per capita, Human Development Index, all through to the early 70s when they started pulling away from Ghana because unlike focusing on the individual, they, they focus on developing the national economy. Mm -hmm. And as the national economy develops, all of us benefit. Yes. But when you um, concentrate on the development of the individual at the expense of the collective, the, then there becomes yeah, institutionalized instability in the body politic, and that is a challenge. What was your plan right now that sadly you lost the election? I think it's going to have an impact. Oh, on no. I, first of all, I still have one and a half years yes. to be a member of parliament. Secondly, I still have to work for my party to win the national election. And thirdly, I can always find something to do. I can go back to the academia. I can go to consultancy. And if my party wins, I could still, uh, my services could still be uh, designed yeah. by leadership. And so um, I just have less stress next in a constituency <laughs> today. My last question. We have the youth these days who look up to politicians, who are also desperate, thinking coming to parliament is one of the easiest ways to make money. Some, we have a lot of people who look up to you. What are your words of encouragement to these people? How should they go about their politics in a very sane manner? Politics is not about making money. Unfortunately, that is the perception that some have, and I believe it is an erroneous perception. If you come to politics to make money, you will never make an impact. You come to politics to serve. And in serving the people, you have the appropriate recognition. You will build the appropriate networks that you may later be able to leverage um, for a livelihood once you've left politics. Politics must never be about making money. Anybody who comes into politics to make money is in the wrong profession. And definitely, Nemesis will catch up with the person. Come to politics, I advise the youth. And personally, I will think of that I would discourage people from coming into political office straight from school. Mm -hmm. I rather encourage people to work, gain some experience, whether in industry, in business, in academia, uh, in entrepreneurship. Why so, Doc? What are you bringing to parliament? You see, if you come to parliament, especially at the committee stage, the most effective people are people who brings something on board. Okay. For example, when it comes to the energy space, mm. I've been chief executive for BOST. Mm. I've been deputy minister for energy. Mm. I've been chief executive of Petroleum Commission all before becoming an MP. Yeah. So I bring something on board. 
Oh, thank you so much, Anirobo. It's been nice talking to you. So I've been speaking to former Minister for Power, Dr. Kwabena Donko, who is also the Member of Parliament for Pru East. I am Nima Tuyakubu at Oyese, Ghana Web TV. Thank you.